Hello everyone, this is Dave Lipscomb, Director of Strategic Communications for PBI. Welcome back to Corporate Pro Bono's CLO and Pro Bono podcast series. This week's episode features Marcus Brown, Executive Vice President and General Counsel of CPBO Challenge Signatory, Entergy Corporation, headquartered in New Orleans. We talked to Marcus about the dramatic growth of Entergy's pro bono program. We also talked about Entergy's work with the Louisiana Civil Justice Center and the Orleans Parish Civil District Court on the development of the Self-Help Resource Center, which has served nearly 8,000 individuals in three years. It's worth noting that Entergy and its partners will receive the 2016 CPBO Pro Bono Partner Award at PBI's annual dinner in November for their work on this project. We'll provide more information on that after the program. We hope you enjoy the interview. Hi, Marcus. Thanks for joining us on the podcast. Let's jump right in and get started. How about you tell us a little bit about yourself and your legal background? Sure. Uh, I've been practicing law since 1988, uh, and I've been practicing law in New Orleans since 1988. Uh, My career has primarily been in in corporate law. I was in a big law firm, like many people started the big law firm. Uh, I was an adversary of my current employer. Uh, I was hired by Entergy in 1995. Uh, as a litigator, and I uh, have worked in a number of different capacities in, uh, within the legal department since that time. I uh, became general counsel in 2012, and, uh, and most recently, uh, my role has expanded to include not just the legal department, but the corporate communications, federal governmental affairs, and uh, the chief security officer uh, role also reports up to me. So, uh, it's been a it's been a good experience. It's been varied and um, and challenging at times, but uh, but I, I I have always and still do enjoy being a lawyer. That's great. Moving on, why don't you tell us a little bit about Entergy's pro bono program and some of the projects it does? Sure. Uh, you know, we've got about eighty lawyers in our, our department, and uh, we work on a range of uh, pro bono projects. Uh, obviously, we do the kind of uh, traditional volunteer pro bono work where we do adoptions, divorces, you know, wills. Uh, we do interesting sometimes one-time uh, projects. Uh, we have one of our lawyers who did a uh, assisted a French-speaking victim of human trafficking, you know, which was something a little unusual and different. And we also support the pro bono uh, programs that are are in the uh, bar in the in the states where we uh, have a presence. Uh, we have people who are in leadership roles in those pro bono programs. We have people who assist in the kinds of uh, programs that uh, that uh, those pro bono uh, uh, organizations focus on. Uh, for example, uh, we have one of our lawyers who is the chairman of the Mississippi Volunteer Lawyers Project, which was which is a uh, the the premier uh, pro bono program in Mississippi. Uh, you know, we've got people on the board of the New Orleans Pro Bono, Pro Bono Project here in New Orleans, and uh, it is the, you know, the primary resource for pro bono uh, in the area, in the metro New Orleans area. So we do it both on an individual basis, uh, uh, we do it uh, in leader, leadership roles, and we've also obviously provided funding to uh, a number and a range of organizations across the uh, what I would call the the system is the new, the energy system, uh, the places where we operate. So why is pro bono so important uh, to the various stakeholders? Uh, you know, law department leaders, the business community, uh, the legal department itself, and the staff, the communities that you serve. Um, what makes it so crucial? Well, if you think about you know. Uh, the company's mission, and, and, and a big part of our mission is to, to provide value to four key stakeholders. That's our owners, our customers, our employees in the communities where we serve. And, you know, and while the corporation, you know, provides, uh, a, you know, a service in terms of the product that we sell, electricity, uh, we've got 13,000 employees, and We've got 80 lawyers, and there's a lot that we can do to impact those communities 
beyond the service that we provide. And so what we really try and do is have our employees be active members of the communities and the, uh, the, the, um, the environments where we, we work and live. And one of the ways we do that is through pro bono. Uh, we've done it uh, for a long time. We focused on it much more intensely since 2012 when I took over the group, but it's always been a part of the, the company's DNA to, uh, to have a very strong community service in a broad sense and a pro bono and a targeted sense, uh, uh, um, you know, commitment. Your department is a signatory to the Corporate Pro Bono Challenge Initiative. Uh, why is that important? Being a signatory to the Corporate Pro Bono Challenge Initiative is just one way to sort of confirm our commitment uh, to dedicate the time and the resources to supporting uh, pro bono. Uh, you know, it's something that a lot of lawyers um, have a personal commitment to doing it, but uh, when a company makes a commitment to do that, it's also committing uh, that it will uh, support its employees and taking the time off um, and, and, and devoting that time to pro bono. It's committing that it will provide the, the uh, financial resources for uh, those lawyers to go out and do that kind of work. And it, it also is a commitment really to, to recognize and, and acknowledge the, the good work that those lawyers are out there doing. So, uh, so it's, it's, it doesn't make the commitment um, any different, but confirming it by signing on certainly makes it visible and, uh, and, and everybody else can see that we're doing it. And, uh, and, and, and to some extent, maybe it even encourages others to uh, make a similar commitment. You mentioned you, the department is focused more uh, intently on pro bono since you've gotten there. Um, so, you know, as the chief legal officer, what role do you play in encouraging pro bono um, in the department and also more broadly, which you touched on a little bit talking about the challenge? As young lawyers, many of us start out, you know, and we make a commitment to pro bono because it's something that uh, we have a personal interest in doing. And I certainly have that personal interest. Uh, as you uh, continue to grow and, and, and develop uh, and move through your career, uh, sometimes you have opportunities to, to uh, expand your, you, the breadth of your influence um, on something like pro bono. And, and I've certainly had that opportunity in going from uh, a lawyer who was only responsible for getting my work done to being responsible for a, a, an entire legal department. And so what we've tried to do is to sort of elevate uh, the, the commitment to something that many people already felt like, felt like was important to them, uh, but to do it in a way where we show the kind of leadership and the kind of support that we could get the entire department on board. And so what we've done is we've uh, transitioned from uh, pro bono being a purely voluntary uh, thing that you do. Uh, we've actually made it uh, a minimum mandatory commitment to pro bono within our legal department. Now that commitment is only 10 hours, which is short of the 50-hour aspirational goal that many uh, law, law firms or many, many states have as part of its bar association uh, uh, recommendations. But um, many of our lawyers meet or exceed that 50-hour uh, 50 uh, commitment anyway. But what we wanted to do was to set a floor so that every lawyer here uh, understood that you know, there was an expectation that they would be out in the community finding something that was important to them that was also going to be beneficial to, to the community on the, on the pro bono front and get involved in that work. And we give them the time off work to do that. We provide the, the financial resources to support that. And, and we, we recognize those people when they have gone out and, and done good things in the community. So what we've seen is when I uh, took, the, took the leadership in the department in 2012, we really had about a 22% participation rate amongst our lawyers in doing pro bono. Um, and now we've got about a 98% participation rate, participation rate amongst our lawyers. Uh, and on the pro bono side, we've gone from about 500 pro bono hours in a year to now we're well over 2,000 hours per year as a department. 
Oh. And uh, and that's been increasing through 14, 15, and 16. We're midway through um, 2016, and we're looking like we're on track to surpass uh, the, the 2015 total, which was about uh, 2,100 hours. So, so it's something we take seriously. Uh, uh, people, I think, enjoy uh, being involved in things that that you know that matter to them, and uh, and and having an employer who allows you to take allows you to take the time from work to go out and do this is something that I think uh, many of our lawyers appreciate. Few legal departments require pro bono legal service due to concerns that doing so might result in a check-the-box mentality among volunteers or might be too difficult to enforce. What were your considerations in adopting a mandatory pro bono policy? Well, there are, there are, there are, there are a few things that we looked at. You know, the first thing is is you want to make sure that you are not setting up yourself for failure. You're not creating a, a, a commitment that, you know, the people in your organization are, are really not interested in meeting in. And as we talk to lawyers, um, you know, we found that many of them uh, either were involved and wanted to have further involvement or weren't involved, but they had some reasons why. They either didn't understand how to get involved they were a little bit leery of some of the kinds of things they might be asked to do and whether they were capable of doing them. So we coupled uh, that commitment with, we partnered with a lot of the, the bar associations. They will come in and they will provide the kind of training that you might need to have your lawyers prepare to go out and say, do uh, uh, divorce work or to do some child custody work. Uh, there's sometimes a concern about whether or not there's um, a sufficient uh, liability insurance, and many bar associations will provide, you know, the the uh, the insurance that it, uh, lawyers need to, you know, to to go out and do that work without having concerns that they may be, you know, faced with some claim. Uh, and we also back that up as a company. Uh, you know, the company also you know, obviously wants to be in the position to to uh, to authorize the things that our lawyers are going out to do. But once that authorization is given, uh, we are actually backing up those lawyers, you know, in all respects in terms of, uh, you know, the expectations that they would have that, that a company would be supportive of the work that they're doing. So, so you know, we, we spend a lot of time talking about the barriers to, you know, involvement, and then we spend time trying to find ways to address those barriers, and we continue to do that on an annual basis. And the combination of those things have made it much easier for people to, 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 you know, to sort of accept the commitment and to really get involved and take, take, you know, take hold of it. And, and actually, you know, the outcome has been better than I could have expected. It's great to hear that the legal department has been proactive about engaging attorneys who maybe have not done pro bono before and might be apprehensive about it. What was your experience like being introduced to pro bono? You know, I think back uh, as a young lawyer, you know, I was motivated by a couple of things to do pro bono. One, I came from a family, uh, there were no lawyers in my family. I, you know, my sister and I were the first lawyers in, 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 I think, in the history of our family. And so not having access to legal support, not having that kind of comfort or access to justice was something that I grew up being very aware of. And so uh, I felt a commitment to, to being involved in that way when I started practicing law. Uh, and I think many people have that motivation. The other thing, is there is something that you, you get back from uh, your commitment to pro bono as a young lawyer because many of the young lawyers who join firms, particularly if you join a big firm, uh, there's just a limit to the kind of real action you, know, you get to engage in. You know, do you get to take depositions? Do you get to go to trial? Do you get to, to interview witnesses? Um, when you take a pro bono case, that's typically your case, and you have an opportunity to, to, to learn and practice and do things as a young lawyer that you probably can't do in your firm because your firm probably has a very prescribed timetable in terms of when lawyers get an opportunity to do certain things. So on the one hand, it was giving, and secondly, it was getting back, you know, the experience and the skill development that comes with doing the kinds of cases that you get an opportunity to do. 
You've certainly got the, uh, you know, good numbers in terms of uh, your pro bono participation and the increase in hours. Um, but what about the projects themselves? Are there any particular uh, pro bono efforts that you are um, exceptionally proud of um, that you've done in your department or any efforts that have been particularly meaningful? Yeah, I think I'd highlight the uh, the self the self help resource center that we support in Orleans Parish here in in, in New Orleans, and what that is is a a, a pro bono assistance uh, resource for uh, pro se litigants, and as you might imagine, uh, in a civil district court setting, there are lots of people who have the kinds of problems that they can either largely resolve themselves if they understood the legal process or certainly with a little bit of assistance from lawyers. And so what we do is we staff that uh, resource center with four lawyers um, twice a week. And, uh, and we just either generally uh, take problems that people have and provide general advice, or we provide the kinds of documents and forms and you know, and, and paperwork that people need to, to do the kinds of things that they can do themselves. And that program has been so successful that it's actually been duplicated in a number of the other court systems in our region. Uh, and even though we aren't necessarily uh, providing the, the lawyers to staff those other centers, uh, you know, we've worked with them to, to, you know, to put together the program. You know, we provide the kind of guidance. We do training. And, and I think that's been a real win-win for both us and the courts um, because uh, what it does, is it, it provides access to justice for a lot of people, but it does it in a way where uh, it doesn't uh, overwhelm the judges and the staff in, in the courts who would be willing to provide help but just don't have the time and the resources to deal with the kinds of issues that might be coming in through that uh, the, through the avenues that the Self-Help Resource Center can, can actually help manage. That's excellent. I uh, love hearing those types of success stories, and particularly yeah. when they are uh, replicable and replicated uh, yeah. in other places. Uh, as you said, that provides a great um, a channel for access to justice for folks that otherwise might not get it. As you've, le- excuse me, as you've advanced in your legal career, what role has pro bono played in that, if any? Well, I think if you if you if you think about um, you know what a the the life of a general counsel in a Fortune 250 company might be like, a lot of what I do is you know really you know commercial, uh, very focused on you know the management of the team and getting the key initiatives of the company sort of uh, you know. Uh, aligned and 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 hopefully successfully achieved, but um, but there is still the need to a be connected to your community in a way that's separate from the work that you do, and then b to to do things that that just matter to you and and you know it's a for me it's just been a way to stay close to uh, people and close to the communities that you now we actually serve. I mean, I actually I actually go out and, and work at the self-help desk. I'm very involved in the pro bono project here in New Orleans. I've been on the board. I've been one of the key fundraisers. I go out. I, I still take pro bono cases. It's just a way to you know to, to stay connected because uh, sometimes the kind of work that you do can 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 disconnect you from you know, the people that you're actually, you know, doing it for. And, and it's a way for me to just uh, to, to keep things, as they say, keep things real. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's great. <laughs> um, <laughs> thanks again uh, for joining us for this. I mean, we really appreciate it, and we love uh, being able to hear the perspective uh, of folks who are in your position. Well, thank you for inviting me to participate. Thank you for listening to our interview with Marcus Brown, Executive Vice President and General Counsel of Entergy Corporation. We hope you enjoyed it and that you will join us again for future episodes of the CLO and Pro Bono podcast series. 
To stay up to date on our podcast, subscribe on iTunes or visit cpbo.org slash podcast. In addition, you are invited to attend the PBI annual dinner on November 3rd in New York, where Entergy and its partners will receive the 2016 CPBO Pro Bono Partner Award for their collaboration on the Self-Help Resource Center and where we will celebrate the 10th anniversary of the CPBO Challenge Initiative and all of its signatories. For more information about in-house pro bono, the CPBO Challenge Initiative, and the PBI Annual Dinner, visit CPBO's website at cpbo.org. Thanks again, and we'll see you next time.